culture, day two, day three, that kind of stuff. Okay, so when I'm saying post-op, the immediate is as soon as the patient's surgery is complete, they will be taken from the surgery room, the OR suite, by the CRNA to the post-op unit. That's called an immediate or an acute post-op area. That is just a big old room that has lots of cubicles in it and the patient is just wheeled into a cubicle. The nurse will then receive the report from the CRNA. What kind of things do you think is going to be vital for that CRNA to report to that post-op nurse? Vital signs. Vital signs. Especially, especially which vital sign? CO or O2. SAP. Respiratory is good, but it and temp important as well. They can't come out of that OR till their temp is 97. I've got to warm that patient up. So they may have to stay in the operating room until we get that temperature at 97. So they had both of our patients in those bear hugger things. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Um, she's talking about a bear hugger. I didn't really talk too much about that in the intra-op. But what that <coughs> is, it's basically a big old tube that's connected to hot air. It's put on the patient, especially up through here, and down on their arm. So warm air is pumped into th that little hugger thing and it's placed on the patient to help them keep their temperature up while they're in surgery. So that is, because temperature dropping in surgery is very, very common. And our patient can go, you know what happens if they drop their temp? Everything's gonna start doing what? Shutting down when, they, when they're hypo. So I gotta make sure that temp's staying. One of the first things that you'll see, that CRNA will probably check that temp through the nasal plug or probe before she takes that patient out of the OR. She ha it is their policy, here I am preaching about policies, because you know you're gonna have to follow policies. I heard Ms. Zimmerman really, really got her group this past week on policies. She was really, grinding it down your throat about how important policies are. But the policy is I can't take that patient to the post-op area because they're not ready. Their vital signs are not stable. So you do, and if you look at it that way, that makes a little bit more sense, doesn't it? Don't, I, don't want to be transferring a patient somewhere if I've got unstable vital signs. So here I, I gotta make sure that that patient temp is 97 or greater. All right, so one thing that you're also going to see in the immediate post-op area is you're going to have immediate access to any type of emergency equipment. So when you go to the post-op, the acute post-op area, look where that crash cart is because you may be the nurse, the student nurse is standing there and somebody looks at you and says, I need the crash cart because a lot of times patients crash right after they're get, they get out of surgery. So I've got to make sure that I know where that equipment is so I can readily get to it. Um, the one thing with the post-op nurse, dang it, here I go again. Ah. With, a, with the position of a post-op nurse, they have to be skilled in all ages, because we saw lots of pediatric patients, lots of newborns, they got to know how to react. They have to have their um, CPR, they have to have advanced um, life support certification. They have to have all that because they never know what patients are coming in there. They have to be able to know how to care for those patients age-wise and in, in any emergency situation. They also have to understand the anesthetic medications because they, that CRNA is going to tell them, right? The patient got this man, this much man, this much man, this much man. So they're going to tell them every medication. So a post-op nurse has to understand 
if my patient received, just like with you guys, if my patient received this type of medication, I got to know what the side effects are to be looking for what I need to be looking for. And one of the major ones would be what? Bleeding, bleeding or respiratory depression. Respiratory distress. Because that is a major side effect of every medication that we give in the OR. So they've got to know about respiratory. And they've got to be able to think quickly. They've got to be able to look at that patient, assess that patient, and know what to do. All right, so as they come in, and do their assessment, they receive the report from the CRNA, and they start their assessment. One of the biggest things is they're looking at their level of consciousness. I need to know if they're awake or not. I need to know if they know who they are. Are they easy to arouse? That is another thing that, you know, I when I assess level of consciousness, especially someone's coming out of the OR, I know they've had a lot of and I expect my patient to be asleep, right? But I need to, when I'm assessing their level of consciousness, I need to know, Katie, can you wake up? Katie, open your eyes. And if Katie opens her eyes, she may not be able to say, yeah, my name is Katie, da da da, my birthday, da 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 da. She may not be able to tell me all that stuff, but I was able to just barely <coughs> shake her a little bit and say, Katie, open your eyes. You know. And she's responding, her level of consciousness is, now there's some that I can't get woke up. I have to shake and hit on, hit on the bed, you know, try to get them to wake up, make some loud noise. That is a patient that's not easily aroused. Okay? So would I be more concerned about that one as opposed to just someone I can just barely get up? I would really, so that level of consciousness is really, really important when you're assessing. The one thing I wanted to show you, and I'm not sure if you've ever seen this before in the orders, but vital signs are get our, the physician's going to order how often we want the vital signs. And I put an example up here because I wasn't sure if you understood what this means when you see this. Vital signs order Q15 minutes times four. Do you know what that means? It's the first hour. So every 15 minutes for one hour, you're going to check those vital signs. And they have to be documented. Okay? <coughs> the surgeon is not going, they want to know what, how is his vital sign. Now you as a, CR, a CNA are just going to document. As a nurse, you got to know what to do if you see an abnormal vital sign. Okay, what would you think might be something that happens as far as vital signs on a patient who just comes out of surgery? Low O2. Temperature rises? Mm, not yet. Heart, rate. Heart rate's going to go up and blood pressure's going to go down because what are you constantly thinking? They just went through surgery, they might be hemorrhaging. Absolutely. There's a reason why you're doing those vital signs. So you do. Every 15 minutes times four, so that's one hour. Q 30 minutes times four. Two hours. So for two hours, you're going to be doing every 30 minutes. To, have y'all seen orders like this before? Yes. Okay, so you, I want you to be able to see orders to know that those have got to be done. This is a major, major, major problem, or not problem, but a thing that as a nurse, as a post-op, we've got to watch. We've got to watch. Of course, respirations are the most important. Now, we talked about one of the most important. We talked about an outpatient surgery and the criteria that the patient meets, needs to meet before they go home. There's the same criteria sheet when they're inpatient as well. So you're going to have the you're going to keep that patient in the post-op setting until they have met the criteria that is needed i.e. their vital signs are stable for X amount of times. They're able to void. They're easy to wake up. Okay, so there's certain criteria that they've got to meet. Remember, we're trying, not that we're discharging them home all the time. We might be discharging them from the post-op unit to a med surge unit. Okay, so they've got to meet that certain criteria before they're discharged. Of course, respirations are always 
one of the first ones. We, I have drilled respiration into your minds and your hearts and everything else. But we've got to watch. We don't play with respirations in there. Because I know some nurses, they'll come and they'll take that pulse rate and they won't, they'll just look and say, okay, it looks like it's 18. Mm -mm. This is a, not a time that you say it looks like it is. You need to do it. I know y'all don't do it. There's lots of nurses that, oh, he looks like he's breathing about 18 times a minute. Okay, uh-uh. This is vital. I have got to, and a lot of times, remember, we know respiratory depression is very, very common. When they come out of surgery, I sometimes have to lay my hand on their chest to make sure that they've got that rise and fall. And I can count them so much better if I got my hand on their chest. So you need, I, I can't stress you enough about making sure that you check those respirations. Most of the time when they come out of OR and they have respirations that are less than 10, it's probably a respiratory issue, okay? Probably, and it's probably because, I mean, it is a respiratory issue, so it's not like, but it's probably due to the fact that they have anesthesia. Not that I'm making light of it, but at least I know this is probably because they have this. Now, if they start getting slower, it may have some cardiac issues as well. Remember that lung and that cardiac, they love each other and they work together. <coughs> so if it starts, we know that it's gonna get low, then we also, so if I, my point is, is that you might be checking those respirations and they're right at 10. Which 10 makes me, it's like I'm on the fence. It's like, okay, or I'm anticipating that I'm wanting it to go up, but I'm anticipating that it goes down. But I'm looking at that, and I know that i got to look at the pulse and the blood pressure as well. Okay, because I know there's possibly a change in those getting ready to happen as well. All right, breakdown. Now, I probably should have put this over in the intra-op, and I think that's what seen more over in the intra-op. If we put that NG, that ET tube down in our patient, you know, when you get right here, it branches off, right? So I don't want it to go down into the branches when I intubate a patient. But sometimes it will go down there. And the way that you can check placement is to get that stethoscope and listen to breath sounds. Every CRNA that's intubating someone, as soon as they complete the intubation, they get that stethoscope out and they are listening to make sure, or the anesthesiologist are listening to make sure that we have equal breath sounds. Because what can happen is sometimes it can go down farther into the right tree and then you will not have breast sounds on the right side. <coughs> so if you're in the OR and that nurse anesthetist or that anesthesiologist says, Kristen, here's a stethoscope, listen. You better be listening to make sure that both of those are equal. And I can tell you by knowing them that they probably have pushed the tube farther down than it needs to be pushed. Because they want you to hear the difference in having absent breath sounds and absent breath sounds. Y'all make you look scared or you... So if you push it so, into the right side, you're going to hear no breath sounds? Absolutely. If you push it down deeper or too far, you're not going to hear breath sounds. And they, may, they want you, so you might be the one that that patient is dependent on <coughs> to hear if he's, because if it's in the right side and he doesn't have adequate breath sounds, he has absent breath sounds, is he ventilating? No. No, he is not ventilating. So what are we putting our patient at risk for? Tissue perfusion. Obviously tissue perfusion problem, but he ain't breathing, so he ain't going to be get O2. And then... He could die. <laughs> He's dead. So I don't want you to 
kill your patient. So this is a vital part of when you see that ET tube, you've got to, it's just like with any other tube that we place, like an NG tube, don't you check placement? Mm -hmm. An ET tube, be really important to make sure that you got that one in there because that's pretty intense stuff as far as ventilating our patient. Okay, so you're gonna be seeing that done and mostly in the OR. Um, once we start looking at our patient, so the ET2 will be pulled by the time you get to the post-op situation. But still, I've got to listen to those breast sounds. I've got to make sure that they are adequately, adequately <clears throat> intaking and outtaking of the O2 and CO2. A lot of times when, when we're assessing respirations, we're looking for sounds that they make. One of the biggest things that you will hear when you are in the OR and patients are having trouble is the snoring and the, remember the strider we talked about in um, respiratory? If I hear that strider, I am absolutely sure that there's an airway obstruction in the post-op. So if I hear the strider, which is hoo, hoo, like that, um, that means that's telling me that I have got some type of obstruction there. Probably caused by the trauma of the intubation, but still the airway is jeopardized. So at that point, what do you think you would do? Oh, it's what cold. What would you think that you would do? Are you hot or That's cold. cold. <laughs> I'm like, please don't. <laughs> yeah, look down their throat. Look at, but what would be something I, because you're already knowing that there is an obstruction there. What can you do? You, they already got oxygen on. I don't want to reintubate yet. But is there something else I could put in there? Not suction. They got oxygen. I got to open the airway. Check their tongue. No, no meds. All you've got to do, and if y'all talked about seizures yet, and when patients are having seizures and you put something like, um, they stop the thing in the LMA is what it's called, a laryngeal mask. It's not a mask, but it's just a little. Help me with the term, y'all. We don't know what we're talking about. Samantha, help us out. An LMA, but I can't, it's laryngeal something airway. So it's a portable airway is what it is. I don't have to put that in ET tube back down. All it is is a little plastic thing. Y'all want me to draw it? Sure. Here we go again.